In today's lesson, we are learning to compare and contrast two or more characters in a story. We will be successful when we can identify the main characters, compare the two characters, so tell how they are alike, contrast the two characters, tell how they're different, and identify text evidence that supports how they are alike or different. Chapter two. Geography is the last class of the day. Ben stares out of the classroom window at the rain beating against the glass. He can hear it on the roof, too, and see it making puddles on the playground dance. It's rained or snowed or sleeted just about every day since he moved to Massachusetts. Mrs. Kutcher holds up a sheet of paper. This is the most important project of the year, she says. We've been studying different ecosystems and biomes all year, and now you get to choose your favorite one. You'll need to use your reading and writing and research skills and everything you've learned about different ecosystems. You'll have two months to do it, but you should start working on it now. A project this big can't be done at the last minute. Mrs. Kutcher gives the first person in each row a stack of information pages to pass back. Ben stares at Jenny's long black hair while he waits. It's always straight and neat, like she brushes it a thousand times every morning. Jenny takes a sheet, then turns to hand the stack to Ben with a smile. She has a gap between her two front teeth that makes her smiles relaxed and friendly, which seems different from her neat, combed hair. Jenny turns back and picks up the book she was reading. She is a book sponge. Some kids read one book every two weeks. She reads one every other day. In fact, she reads so much that she gets in trouble for it, which seems pretty funny to Ben. Teachers are always telling you how important reading is. And then when you actually read a lot, you get in trouble for it. But Jenny's head is always buried in a book. And it's usually a book that doesn't have anything to do with what they're studying. Mrs. Kutcher almost always has a book on her desk that she's taken away from Jenny during health or geography or even reading. Jenny is smart in a very weird way. Not in the way of always doing exactly the right thing in school. She's smart in seeing the world in a way that others don't. Like, she has her head tilted to one side a little and looks at the world from a different angle. Jenny turns back to Ben again, still wearing her gap-toothed grin. What did Mrs. Tibbetts say to you? She whispers. Ben shrugs. Did you get in trouble? Ben shakes his head. I don't think so. It seemed like she was mad, but then she didn't do anything. She told me not to touch the mice. I wonder what she uses them for. My brother, excuse me, Jenny, Mrs. Kutcher interrupts their conversation. Could you please turn around and pay attention? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. Jenny gives Ben another quick smile and turns around. Ben feels his face turn red. He looks at the assignment sheet. Geography Project, Exploring World Ecosystems. Your major report for the spring will be on an ecosystem anywhere in the world. In the report, you should explain the following. What and where the ecosystem is. What the climate is like. Which plants and animals are part of it. How it fits in with the other ecosystems of the world. Please also discuss what makes the ecosystem a unique place and what threatens it. The report should be three to five pages in length. Please include artwork, charts, or models that will help us understand the special nature of your habitat. You may choose your own topic or ask me for help in selecting one. The project is due Friday, June 5th. Ben knows right away what topic he wants to do. Other kids are looking at their papers and some are already waving their hands in the air. Mrs. Kutcher, can I do the rainforest in Costa Rica? Jenny asks. The teacher nods. That's what I wanted to do, someone whines without waiting to be called on. Three or four other kids join in. Like the rainforest is the only interesting place in the world. Frankie Murley shouts out, I want the beach where I can see bikinis. His buddies break out laughing. Mrs. Kutcher shoots Frankie a look, but he doesn't seem to care. He's scored points with his friends. 
Ben isn't interested in the rainforest or the beach. He shoots up his hand in the air, and Mrs. Kutcher calls on him. Can I do the desert? He asks. The Sonoran Desert in Arizona? Sure, says Mrs. Kutcher. You must know a lot about it already. Ben nods. Who ever heard of a snoring desert? Frankie shouts. And the same crew of boys snickers. Sonoran, Ben pronounces the word slowly. It's the name of the desert around where I lived in Tucson. Sonoran, snoring, Frankie sneers. Whatever, it's all he talks about. Who cares about Tucson anyway? Ben pretends he doesn't hear. Jenny looks back at Ben and rolls her eyes. He shrugs. He wonders if it's true. Is it all he talks about? Maybe so, he thinks, and he, it's no wonder. Tucson sure was better than here, especially with kids like Frankie around. Finally, he sneaks a glance at Frankie, who's smirking at his friends. Tommy Miller reaches across the aisle and gives him a high five. Jenny mouths the words to Ben. He's an idiot. Mrs. Kutcher raises her voice, trying to get the class back on track. That's enough for now. I'll have a little conference with each of you to find out what you'd like to do. I have a list of ecosystems, and I'm sure each of you can find an interesting one that no one else is doing. She looks at the clock and says, Okay, class, pack your things. It's nearly time to go. All the way to Snoring Desert, Frankie taunts. You can't win with Frankie, and Ben knows it. He keeps his mouth shut and concentrates on stuffing his notebooks and books in his backpack. By the time Ben gets on the bus, most of the seats are taken. All of the fifth graders are in the back of the bus, where they always sit. Ryan's back there, too, and calls to him. But Ben chooses a seat halfway back with a third grader he doesn't know. Ben's sister Agatha is on the bus, too. She's sitting in the front row with Rory, Ryan's sister. They're both in second grade. Agatha and Rory are laughing and talking with the kids in the seat behind them as the bus pulls out of the cir school circle, and Ben wonders why it is so easy for his sister to make friends. It's like she's lived in Edinburgh forever. Maybe it's because she talks too much. Ben looks out the window. He doesn't see that much point in talking unless it's about something important. At about the third stop on the route, Ryan lurches down the aisle. When he gets to Ben's seat, he peers down at him with his good eye. See you tomorrow, Ben! Ben nods, then quickly looks out the window again. Then Ben hears Frankie's voice. Arr, Captain Kidd! Captain Kidd! Goodbye, Captain Kidd! Ben can't help looking back. Frankie's got a hand over one eye like it's a patch. A couple of the other boys are laughing. Ben turns in time to see Ryan getting off the bus. His head is down, and his ears are bright red. Frankie and his buddies are already ragging on one of the fourth graders. When the bus comes to a stop at the end of Ben's street, he steps out the door into the drizzling rain. Agatha is waiting for him at the bottom of the stairs. Come on, Ben, let's run. I'm not running. You can if you want. But Mom says we have to walk together. Agatha says in that whiny little sister voice that she was born with. Then we can walk, Ben answers. But we'll get wet. Agatha, go ahead and run if you want. I'm walking. Poop head, his sister says. She whirls around and takes off down the street. Ben holds his backpack on top of his head to keep the rain off and plods towards his house. The entire sky is gray, and some of the pedals, puddles on the street are deep. His feet get wet, even though he's watching where he's stepping. The grass in the yards is beginning to turn green again, but there are no leaves on the trees yet. He peers up from his backpack. The tree branches hang over the street. There are tons more trees here than in Arizona. He tries to imagine all the branches filled with leaves. Ben cr cuts across a yard to avoid a big puddle on the sidewalk. The ground is like a soaked sponge. The water wells up under his, around his shoes. 
The smell of the wet earth fills the heavy air. He's never seen this much water lying around before. The desert has gentle rains in the winter and hard, huge thunderstorms in the summer, but the rain soaks into the dry earth or runs off in a matter of hours. It never stays around for long. Ben used to love the big thunderstorms. He could always smell them coming. The wind whipped up in front of them as the storms rolled across the desert floor and the clouds rose higher and higher in the sky. Out there, everything races and crashes and breathes like it's a living thing, he thinks. Here in Massachusetts, the rain just goes on and on. Nothing very exciting about that. Thinking about the thunderstorms reminds Ben of the things from his bedroom that got lost on the move. He'd collected most of them himself, but some of the best stuff came from the Desert Museum. Mr. Thompson had given him a rabbit skull and a fossil of a trilobite, a sea creature from millions of years ago. But his favorite thing was the shed skin from a king snake. Ben had watched the snake in the display case at the museum for over an hour while it wriggled out of its old skin and left it behind. Its head and body emerged with new skin that was bright and shiny and vibrant. It was one of the most amazing things Ben had ever seen. Mr. Thompson gave him the dried old crinkly skin that stretched out even longer than the three-foot snake itself. But it wasn't just the displays and creatures in the museum that made it so great. Even better were all the things he learned about there about the desert. And the more he knew, the more he wanted to know. Every time he went to the museum, he peppered Mr. Thompson and the other guides with a thousand questions. Ben, his mother had said, you'll drive them crazy. But Mr. Thompson and the others seemed happy to share what they knew. That's what we're here for, the old man had said. The guides taught Ben to be watchful and patient when he was outside. Nature shows itself when you give it time. There are a lot of critters out there, Mr. Thompson had said. And you'll see them if you know how to be still and wait. Ben had learned to be patient. In Arizona, he'd grab a snack after school and then walk down the river wash at the end of his street. There were new houses going up, but behind them were, was just open space. The desert stretching out and up into the foothills of the mountains west of Tucson. After the area's big thunderstorms, a river ran through the wash, creating a lush place for trees and plants that wouldn't last a week in the dry ground a hundred yards away. Ben had a favorite wading place in the river wash a big rock in the shade of a cottonwood tree. He would sit there, not moving at all, and after a while, he'd always see something. Mice were regulars, and ground squirrels and lizards. Sometimes he saw j javelinas, small wild pigs, snorting and scurrying from one bush to another. And on the few lucky occasions, he saw snakes. The more he watched and waited, the more animals he saw and learned to identify. One Saturday when he was home, he heard his mother give a little yelp as she walked into the laundry room. Ben ran to see what was wrong. It's a frog, she said, pointing to the corner. Ben looked closely. No, Mom, it's a toad, he said. It's a Colorado River toad. I don't care what it is, his mother said. I don't want it anywhere near my washing machine. The large squat toad sat in the corner, looking perfectly happy to be there. He won't hurt anything, Ben said. He'll eat the spiders. Ben talked his parents into leaving the toad there for uh, several days. He was happy, and so was the toad, but his mom wasn't. Ben finally carefully scooped it into a box, took it back down to the river wash, and let it go. Ben's toad removal, his father had quipped. In Arizona, Ben spent as much time outside as he could. Most of the kids from school were busy doing other things, either playing sports or staying inside with their computers or, and TVs, but Ben didn't really like team sports, although he was big for his age and people always wanted him on their team. And he couldn't stand spending too much time inside. It made him feel like 
He was wasting the day, wasting the sun. He liked being outside by himself or with someone who liked the outdoors as much as he did. Toby was the only other kid he knew who was happy spending the day exploring the nearby desert. Ben and Toby had started a collection of things they'd found. They got a terrarium and put things in it and named it Desert World. They filled the bottom with sand and some rocks, then planted a few small cactuses and turned it into a sort of ant farm. An ant and stink bug farm, actually. Ben loved catching stink bugs, funny little critters that lifted their back ends high in the air when they thought they were being attacked. But the main inhabitant of the desert world was Lenny, a western banded gecko. Toby and Ben had spent hours watching the small, quick lizard as it scurried around its little home, dining on the stink bugs and grasshoppers they fed it. But Ben had to leave all that behind in Tucson. Now Toby was caring for Lenny and everything else in Desert World. Maybe, Ben thinks, the moving people have found the box and I'll get my collection of rocks and bugs back and my books and posters. Okay, guys, I want you to think about chapter two and what we learned about Ben. Is there anything new that you learned? Were there any new characters introduced? Did you relate to any of the characters? Be ready to talk about this chapter in your Zoom meeting. <laughs>